grateful to little sisters, especially now that we have this COVID-19. As you see, I'm on a wheelchair. I cannot go too far. I would love for this to continue to get food because I cannot afford to buy food for me and my children. I live on one income and I am very thankful and very grateful uh, to this service here. Thank you for joining us. This is Feeding East Harlem, Little Sisters' second event in our Social Determinants of Health series. I'm Cappy Collins, your moderator for tonight's panel. As a pediatrician in East Harlem and a member of the New York State Children's Environmental Health Centers and an LSA board member, the social determinants of health determine my work because they determine which people will unjustly suffer from more disease and less success in life. I use the word unjust because this is not right. We should not let people predictably and preventably suffer more than other people. Today we're talking about food security. Do we worry about having enough to eat? Can we feed our children? Can we feed our elders? People of color are disproportionately affected. According to the Department of Agriculture, 19% of black households and 16% of Hispanic households experienced food insecurity in 2019, while white Americans were at 8%. That was 2019. Does anyone remember 2000? 19. This is the end of 2020. What has changed? The same problems have gotten worse. Let's be specific. What happened if you depended on school lunches? What happened if you depended on senior centers? What happened if you lost your job? Hunger Free America's report tells us that New York City food pantries increased the number of people served by an average of 7% per year, 7% per year from 2015 to 2019. In 2020 to date, the increase is 65%. In fact, 37% of New York City pantries and kitchens were actually forced to turn people away, reduce their portion sizes, or limit their hours of operation due to a lack of resources in the face of the rapidly increasing need. But how about here at Little Sisters? I wanna recognize the leadership, the staff, the volunteers, the donors for astounding work. Within two weeks of the shutdown in March, reorganized to ensure that our essential services would continue. When the pandemic first hit, Little Sisters Food Pantry was feeding about 150 families per week. Anyone want to guess how many we fed at the height of the pandemic? If you're following the math, a 65% increase would put us at about 250 families. The reality was 800 families at the peak. We're talking more than a 500% increase. We're currently feeding about 450 to 500 families a week, a mere 300% increase over normal. The need in East Harlem is stark and it's greater than living memory can compare. LSA is responding as we always do to our thousands of families. We've responded for 60 years and we can also prevent. We have solutions at hand to stop 
predictable and preventable suffering thanks to public health evidence and the strong network of partners in East Harlem. We continue to pay the interest on society's investment in inequality, but we can also pay down the principle. These wicked problems can be minimized and that's why we're here tonight. You all are our power partners. Although you are on mute, you are not silent. Send your questions to us via the chat at the bottom of your screen. We will answer them at the end of the discussion. If we are not able to get to your question, we will follow up with you after the discussion. And now I get the pleasure of introducing our... Ray Lopez is the Director of Programs and Director of the Environmental Health and Family Asthma Program at Little Sisters Family Health Service. Ray lives in East Harlem and has deep firsthand knowledge of the community's needs. He oversees nursing, advocacy and food pantry, parenting and child development and K through four after school enrichment. His environmental health services team focuses on asthma prevention using a holistic hands-on approach to improve housing conditions. Hallie Chu is the deputy director of policy at the office of the Manhattan Borough President's Office. Hallie oversees the Fresh Food Food Box program in partnership with Grow NYC. She also works with the New York City Department of Sanitation and members of the Manhattan Solid Waste Advisory Board on zero waste issues, which include diverting organics away from landfills through food donation, composting, and renewable energy production. Charles Platkin is a distinguished lecturer and executive director of the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center and editor of dietdetective.com. As a public health advocate, his syndicated health, nutrition, and fitness column, The Diet Detective, appears in more than 100 daily newspapers and media outlets. Thank you all for being, being here tonight. I'd like to jump right into our first question for Ray about LSA's long history of serving East Harlem so Ray, can you tell us briefly about how LSA's food pantry got its start and its significance within the community? Sure, thank you, Cappy. Thank you panelists, Hallie and Charles for, for joining me today and thank you all for, for attending this evening. Um, so Little Sisters of the Assumption Family Health Service incorporated as a nonprofit over 60 years ago uh, after moving from the Lower East Side to East Harlem and its first program focused on nursing care in the homes of uh, East Harlem families. And the Little Sisters of the Assumption who were nurses noticed that the pantries and cupboards of the families that they were visiting often lacked food. So the food pantry was created to fill that need. Um, our food pantry now has grown to be one of our most utilized programs and really one that the East Harlem community has come to count on. Uh, the program not only provides us supplemental food to families, but it also screens community members for other needs and connects them to LSA programs and to other community resources. Follow-up question. So the number of individuals lining up for the food increased significantly since the pandemic started. How are you able to keep up with the demand for food? How was the Little Sisters program able to actually pivot to this need so quickly? Yeah, you know, as you described earlier, we saw a tripling of the number of individuals on our lines uh, each week, uh, but we also doubled the frequency uh, that people could come to get food. So, so it went from once a month to two times a month. Um, and, you know, that increase in demand really strained our ability to provide food uh, in the spring. Um, you know, we closed the pantry for a couple of weeks. We had to recruit new volunteers, redesign the service delivery from a uh, client choice model to curbside distribution. We had to get credit limits increased, implement our payments uh, to remain electronic payments to get to stay under limits, credit limits. Um, 
But then, you know, thanks to the generosity of all the individual donors, donation, uh, their, and their donations, uh, also from foundations and many local partners, uh, we were able to, to keep up with demand uh, over the months. And, uh, you know, we saw other challenges like problems with food delivery, you know, the, the, the pe truck drivers and people in the warehouses getting sick, not being able to deliver to us, um, late uh, deliveries. But, uh, you know, we also had many new local partners uh, who provided uh, to us food uh, and really helped us, um, you know, during those times that were difficult. Thanks, Ray. Uh, I know that your team has done so much work uh, in response to this unprecedented crisis. Um, I think we'll move on to the next topic uh, in regards to um, Hallie's work. Um, I want to congratulate you first on being named one of the 40 under 40 rising stars in New York City food policy by the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center. You live in East Harlem and chose Little Sisters Family Health Service as your food hero. We are flattered, thank you. I know you see a lot of programs in New York City. Why does Little Sisters stand out to you? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, and I think um, definitely feel very honored and um, appreciative that I was named to um, a list with many, a cohort of many, many amazing people. Um, so I really wanted to, you know, when I found out I was selected as a finalist, I wanted to use a platform to just highlight some of the community assets that I, I know are around. Um, and Little Sisters really jumped to mind immediately, um, partly because I had um, been following just right after the pandemic and the shutdown and just the rise in food insecurity, um, just trying to figure out what um, different communities are doing, how different organizations are responding. Um, as you noted earlier, I work at the Manhattan Borough President's Office, and we started pretty early on to compile a list of where people can get food and just to find out you know, what resources are available. Um, so Little, Little Sister was definitely on my radar, very much so. Um, and then the other thing that I um, really appreciate about organization is just the holistic nature of the organization. Um, so just a little bit of a backstory. Um, Ray and I actually met um, back in 2013 when I was on a community board. Um, and at the time we were both on a working group that was spearheaded by Picture the Homeless to start a community land trust in East Harlem. Um, so that's totally, you know, not food topic, but housing related and community organizing. Um, we were on the same outreach team. We went building to building to just talk to the residents, find out how they're doing, learn about just who they are and you know what the dreams and hopes of having secure housing would, would lead to. Um, and that really cemented you know, my understanding of Little Sisters, an organization that really offers you know, holistically a lot of services um, that really um, speak to the whole person, to all of the different areas of need. Um, and then as I got to know the organization better, um, spoke with Ray and his many hats that he wears and different responsibilities that he has, um, it's just, Little Sister has always been one of the organizations that I would recommend to friends or family who just want to know, you know, what a community organization that's deeply rooted in the community, serving the families, you know, all of that, you know, check all the boxes, what that would be like. Um, so I feel honored actually to be able to um, really highlight the organization and hopefully, you know, get the word out of the good work that the organization is doing. You know, I love hearing you talk about land use and equitable housing. I'm certain that'll come up on a future uh, session in this series. Um, I'm going to turn now to Charles uh, and ask you, uh, you know, as the director of the Hunter College Food Policy Center, why do you feel it's important to assess and connect more food resources to the East Harlem community? It might seem obvious, but it'd be great to have your perspective on this. Thank, thank you, Cappy, and thank you to LSA and all the hard work and 
the dedicated people that are there. And thanks for all you do. And Haley, congratulations again. And and you were one of hundreds of people that we uh, that were nominated, and we picked you uh, because of all your hard work. And thanks for all that you you do uh, at the Manhattan Borough President's Office. So I, you know, one of the things that we've We've looked into this um, through research and interviews in different communities and uh, around New York City. There's an overall lack of information for existing and available food resources in New York City. Um, and it's been exacerbated by COVID-19, the COVID-19 pandemic, as everybody's sort of aware. Uh, <clears throat> through qualitative interviews that we conducted in the summer, of this past summer, community members most in need expressed frustration, confusion, and vulnerability around finding food resources for themselves and their family. And thank goodness for places like LSA, but you know, poor communication and information sharing negatively impacts uh, people's connection to food and those that are food insecure, whether they're on uh, you know, um, uh, SNAP or, or have to go to food banks or in need of soup kitchens, these resources need to be connected to that community. And you know, we're, Oftentimes, as academics or food policy advisors, we're talking about new interventions, new programs, uh, adding access with supermarkets and all other kinds of you know, venues and, and brick and mortar and, and non brick and mortar. However, just simply adding new interventions is not necessarily the answer to solve food access issues. And sometimes, and you know, our research has shown that it's important to highlight uh, programs like LSA and your food pantry um, and make sure that everybody in the community is aware of those programs, right? So that's kind of some of the things that we've been, we've been looking at. Um, as a result of what we found very early in the pandemic, um, we created these 59 community um, neighborhood resource guides. And they have things like food pantries, soup kitchens, openings, closings. And I, I think you guys are aware of this supermarkets, delis, bodegas, um, meal hubs, and all ways that you could get access to food. And, and East Harlem is a community that is highlighted. Um, and those are available at nycfoodpolicy.org um, slash food. And the project recruited more than 300 volunteers along with center staff, and we made more than 70,000 update calls to, you know, to food pantries, soup kitchens, to make sure that people are aware, aware of, of what's around them. Um, so I think that assessing food resources in a community is critical, and making sure all that information gets out to the community um, is just as important. And resources to do that are critical, and not always just adding um, more uh, is you know creates uh, impact. Sometimes it's creating awareness. The idea of utilizing what already exists resonates with me. I think that's a foundation of uh, maximizing the efficacy and efficiency of our work. Ray, I want to come back to you um, and ask, as part of Little Sisters advocacy work, you assist families with public health benefit applications including online SNAP enrollment. And that provides nutrition benefits to supplement the food budget of needy families. Little Sisters also has other interesting partnerships, specifically with Randall's Island Urban Farm, uh, who are supplying fresh vegetables to Little Sisters. Can you talk about that and why this partnership is important for our clients? Sure. Um... Yeah, well, just to address the, the first question, the, the SNAP or Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, um, during the, the spring, uh, the renewals were, became automatic. And so what that, in, what that enabled us to do is to have our client advocates focus more on new applications for SNAP. So they, so they uh, identified families who... who and they're always doing this, identifying families who, who actually are eligible for the program, but haven't applied uh, for some reason or another. Um, yeah, you know, the Randall's Island partnership, um, 
was interesting. I mean, I think we all knew that they existed right, right across the, the river. Um, and, you know, they found themselves um, in a situation where they had to shift from uh, being a teaching farm to, um, to figure out what to do with all the food that, that they had uh, grown uh, in the spring. And so they, um, I believe that it was through uh, our council member's office, uh, were linked uh, to us. And um, the partnership allowed us to provide fresh um, uh, and organic fruits and vegetables to our clients. And we actually, um, you know, with, through them, we're able to provide a uh, thousand pounds of produce uh, for distribution at our pantry. And um, yeah, this is this. It's a great uh, partnership to to highlight. Uh, but there are actually many, many more that we have uh, through through our food pantry. Um, you know, United Way is, is another one to to highlight. Um, they, you know, their increases uh, uh, in their line of credit, um, and they're also their local produce link to to a farm um, in upstate New York. Um, you know, as uh, also helping us to, to purchase new uh, refrigeration and, and freezers, uh, you know, in, in this expansion. Um, there are so, so many more. I mean, we, we worked with um, the world, uh, world Kitchen. It's not the exact name, World Central Kitchen. Uh, and uh, provided uh, meals in partnership with local restaurants uh, to a, a number of our families. Um, I could keep going, but maybe I'll stop here so we can continue the conversation. Well, those are great examples of utilizing what exists. Sometimes we're not uh, aware of the uh, potential partnership that we can create with these organizations, or sometimes we're able to use them in ways that are new based on Come back to you. And, oh, um, things changed in 2020. One of those things being the way we're able to go to school. So many kids rely on the National School Lunch Program to get their meals. With many kids learning remotely, how do they receive their meals? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so um, let me, so hopefully it gets through. Let me drop something in the chat right now. Hopefully it sends. Um, so in terms of what the city as a resource offers, um, when the school shut down, um, there was a pretty quick mobilization to make sure um, food in the form of um, school breakfast and lunch continues to be, be available um, to families who is able to pick up. So there are a bunch of grab and go sites and you see in the link, um, there is a pretty good web um, website kind of map um, portal that OEM, the Office of Emergency Management created. Um, so at the moment, um, DOE, Department of Education, it's partnering with the Department of Sanitation um, who um, is sanitation because at the time, the New York City's appointed food czar, Catherine Garcia, she was a commissioner of sanitation at the time. And she repurposed a lot of her actually recycling bureau staff to work on food. And all of that to say, you know, the city did mobilize efforts. Um, so you can see in these resources, there are programs for um, families with children to get food. Um, so within East Harlem, if you go to the map, you can type in East Harlem zip code. Um, and I did it for my own zip code 10035. Um, and the closest school that pops up as a grab and go site is uh, PS57, James Walden Johnson School. Um, so as a resource, I think there are opportunities for parents to pick up meals. Um, they don't check anything. You do show up. You don't have to prove that you have children at home if they don't come with you. And the site has um, expanded. So now there are vegetarian options, halal, um, kosher meals. And um, they have also expanded from 9 a.m. to noon um, for meals to school age children. But then also at 3 to 5 p.m. At those same sites, there are community meals. So for everybody, it doesn't have to be students. 
Um, so I think that is one effort that the city um, provides for families who can go to these grab and go sites. Um, another thing that um, people may be aware of, especially if you have um, school aged children is um, there is the federal government um, through the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. So through some of the CARES money that came down the pipeline to the state, there is a pandemic EBT program. So the short of it is um, families that have school-aged children who would have um, had their um, free breakfast and lunch provided by the school because now they're remote, um, that money was given to families to pay for the food that um, would have gone to uh, feed the children by the schools. So for New York State, it um, ends up being $420 per school-aged children for the period during March through June. So the end of um, the previous school year. Um, the one thing to keep in mind is this is for everybody. So um, you may have, some people received a EBT card in the mail from the New York State because they are not previously on SNAP or on Medicaid. And they're like, what is this card? Is this legitimate? What do I do with it? Um, it is legitimate. And if families that are already on um, SNAP and they have EBT cards, the $420 per school age child is actually deposited directly into those accounts. Um, so the update on that program is now um, for this current fiscal year, Congress actually extended pandemic EBT through the, uh, September, 2021. Um, so people who have the cards who maybe got mailed one um, should hold on to those cards because um, further coming down the line, there may be additional money uh, deposited for um, families to purchase food for their children um, to make up for the, the lack of um, breakfast and lunch provided at school. And then one thing I would add is this um, second round also got expanded. So it includes even younger children that are otherwise would have received free food and daycare facilities um, that um, would still be covered. Um, so I would say more information is forthcoming, but between the city's effort and then also kind of the federal and state's coordination of the CARES money, um, it's not perfect. I think there's still a lot of food needs and family fall through a crack or they're not able to get the food, um, but at least there are options for people to access food. Uh, a, a quick second part to that, uh, as we saw in the intro video, uh, if you are older, you sometimes can come and visit resources in the community as the woman we saw visiting Little Sisters. There are plenty of people who are older or have disabilities who are not able to come to these resources. Any insight on how they can actually be served with food security resources? Um, yeah, definitely. Um, so again, quickly, um, I'll just drop the link so people can check it out themselves. Um, so for older adults or ever just uh, anybody who's homebound and not able to go to grab and go sites, um, there is this program called Get Food NYC. And this program is um, home delivery. So you call um, 311 or you can go to one of the links I dropped to register um, for yourself or for a family or a homebound senior, and they would be able to be enrolled in this program. Um, so the, the way that it works is you enroll for two weeks in, at a time. And during those two weeks, every week there are two deliveries to the person's home. And there'll be, I believe, you know, six meals or you know, enough meals to cover that week or half that week. Um, and then at the end of the two week period, if the person is still homebound, they still need food, they would um, call 311 again or go to the website again to extend their enrollment. Um, so this is one way the city is um, making sure that people who cannot go outside would still get support and still receive food. Um, and this is also at the beginning of the pandemic, this was done in coordination with sanitation department, uh, which again handles food and also DIFTA, Department for the Aging. Um, so they coordinated to have some of the members in the senior centers to get on that list right away um, in order to, you know, now that they weren't able to go to senior centers for food, they can get the food delivered. Um, and I would say like any other program, there are definitely, um, issues and challenges and um, 
things don't always work, uh, which is why I think there's also um, just kind of some information I provided in the chat for troubleshooting. Um, there's a dedicated email address to raise questions and concerns for seniors who did not receive delivery um, or the food was not up to standard and all of that. So it is a resource and um, also wanted to provide a way to uh, raise concerns and questions or even complaints in case it's not working as it should. Thanks for providing those resources in the chat as well. It's great to have at our fingertips. Uh, Charles, we're gonna come back to you for the final question. It's a two-parter and we don't have much time. I'm wondering if you can adequately address um, <laughs> As Little Sisters continues to feed the community of East Harlem, can you talk about some of your key findings and recommendations when it comes to food access in the neighborhood? That's part one. Part two would be, and this sounds like it deserves its own uh, session, but can you also talk about how food insecurity and hunger impact mental and physical health? So I'll, I will keep it short. A few things. So thank you. Haley, for all that information, but I do. I also do want to remind everybody to go to, and I'm putting it right in the chat, nycfoodpolicy.org slash food, because if you go to the East Harlem um, page, it has every detail of where what, what food resources are available in East Harlem, including every, all information about Get Food and for seniors, all the details. Um, and, and by the way, that could be its own session on its own about what's going on in the city and so forth, but we won't touch that. I do want to touch upon two key things, a few key things. One is just, we just had a session, you know, we had over a thousand people on there and they were all, you know, sort of uh, community-based organizations, government staffers and experts in food insecurity. And one of the things that I started with, and I'll do it here and I promise you, Kathy, I'll be quick, is just a quick definition of food insecurity. Because when we did research in East Harlem versus the Upper East Side and looked at what this the term means, most people don't even know. So I just want to you know, clarify that. Food insecurity, according to the USDA, is a limited or uncertain availability of nutritionally adequate and safe foods or a limited or uncertain ability to acquire acceptable foods in a socially acceptable way. So I just wanted to put that out there quickly. And then, you know, just quickly talk about mental health and, um, uh, and, and physical health in relationship to food insecurity. So the event that we had was specifically on mental health. And, and just so we're clear, research has shown that food insecurity in children and even adults is associated with poor health, developmental outcomes, high levels of symptoms of anxiety, depression, aggression, hyperactivity, um, and, 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 and really in adults, depression is a key problem with food insecurity. And it's hard to say whether the food insecurity impacts the, um, the depression or its poverty, but it, it, researchers have isolated it. Food insecurity is a major predictor of poor mental health. Um, so that's important to recognize that most uh, community-based organizations and even government staffers aren't aware of that. Also, food related to chronic diseases is, is incredibly relevant. So eating, a, eating poorly is well documented to uh, create diabetes, cardiovascular disease, hypertension, certain cancers, and the list goes on. And many of these uh, are preventable, okay? And, you know, my father died uh, in the last, you know, uh, two years of diabetes, and it's a horrible disease and has a horrible impact on the family, um, and I know it firsthand. Um, and many of these, again, like I said, are preventable and a healthy diet's not always um, connected with preventing disease, but it mostly is, right? So, um, and, and many realize this, but healthy, the definition, again, back to these definitions is so critical. And when I ask students or I ask um, academics or experts um, about what the term healthy means, and they, there's all different answers. So it's really critical to understand that because we often send these messages, eat healthy um, and don't know what it means. So I wanna just put this out there. Um, when you hear that term, I always want everybody to think about just eating more vegetables, okay? Keep it really simple, right? And you know, when you eat eating more vegetables, you want them to be grilled, sauteed, broiled or raw, and just keep it simple. I think, you know, everybody that's listening today that you know, has connection to community should think about that when they're sending out messages. 
So I know we're short on time and, you know, I'm a lecturer. I could go on for three hours. So I'll, <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> I appreciate your succinct answer to a, an unwieldy que- set of questions, but Charles, Ray and Hallie, thank you all so much for your insight on solutions. Food insecurity exists when society fails. Without reliable, consistent access to adequate food, as Charles just mentioned, our communities cannot thrive. Uh, Children can't excel, families can't succeed, our society is compromised. Uh, So our panelists tonight are on the front lines working to ensure that more people who need healthy food get it. Thank you for helping to feed those in need. I also wanna thank the advocacy food pantry staff at Little Sisters and the army of volunteers who come every week to fill bags with food and then distribute them uh, throughout our community. Uh, Over the next few weeks and months, as the pandemic progresses and the holidays arrive, uh, we can only expect the needs of the community to grow. Please help us by texting LSA to 41444 or by visiting littlesistersfamily.org slash giving. Those will be in the chat. A gift of just $75 can help to feed a family of four for this holiday season. We'll also include a, the donation information uh, below. Uh, and now I'd like to open up to uh, questions. I know we had a few from the audience. Um, so the first one is coming from uh, Wanda Matos to Ray. How? This is an important one, a really important one, because, you know, Success is one thing, but replicating success really uh, proves that this is viable, sustainable. Ray, how can we replicate the wonderful job of Little Sisters in West Harlem with other organizations? That's a wonderful question. Um, You know, I wouldn't presume that that there isn't an organization that's already there that exists that that does excellent work and there might be multiple ones. You know, I know at Little Sisters, uh, we have a very holistic model with a multi-service. And, you know, we also have uh, a significant number of local staff, um, you know, who live in East Harlem or who grew up in East Harlem. Um, and, and, And of course we have, I think our very rich um, work culture at Little Sisters. I mean, everybody just goes above and beyond um, their job description to, to do this work. Um, I think those, those are kind of hard things to, to uh, replicate, uh, but um, you know, I think that uh, you know, working with partners and the assets that are there and, and you know, the organizations that are there um, should be hiring locally and should be finding uh, community members who are invested in their, in their neighborhoods. And, and I think that all, all of those elements make for, for quality services. Um, I know we, we would love to replicate uh, in other neighborhoods, uh, but uh, right now we, you know, we're focused on East Harlem and, and actually a lot of our programs do go be a little bit beyond East Harlem. Our nurses uh, are licensed to practice it in Manhattan and often stray uh, to Central and West Harlem. Um, our food pantry uh, provides emergency bags to people who don't live in East Harlem. Uh, our environmental services, now that it's doing virtual work, we really see anyone uh, in New York City. And so I guess I'll stop there. Thanks, Ray. And we do have another question. Uh, this one for Charles and Hallie. What kind of policies need to be in place to eliminate food insecurity, local or national level? I can start with that, Hallie, if that's okay. So this is something that I've given a lot of thought to um, and, and discuss it frequently um, at the center and, and with other um, uh community members and so forth. It's that, you know, I, I think that the city of New York um, needs to take more responsibility. I know it's a pandemic. I know that things are terrible economically, but eventually the pandemic is going to recede. Okay. And then you're going to, you're going to see what was pre-pandemic, which was, you know, a 
above a million, 1.2 million people that are food insecure. And currently, the numbers are all scattered because we don't have great metrics, by the way. So it's between 1.6 and 2.2 million at any one time in terms of food secure in, in New York City. So what's going to happen? You know, everybody's celebrating the um, sort of the future. We're celebrating the pandemic, you know, receding and there's a few cases and so forth. What happens to those that are food insecure? Are they suddenly going to go away? Are there going to be all these, you know, new jobs created? I don't think so. And I, and I feel like there's going to be a lot of left behind. And that concerns me. So we need to make sure that, number one, that we don't go back and say, oh, pre-pandemic levels, oh, we're great at 1.2 million. Okay, because that's not great. So what do we do to reduce that? And, you know, there's talk, oh, we need to eliminate poverty. Well, I don't see that happening in the next three or four years. And what about those that are hungry right now? What do, what do we do with those people? And I think that the key point here is that New York City needs to be much more involved. They need to provide um, food for those that are food insecure, and they need to maintain the levels that are currently uh, during the pandemic, um, you know, in perpetuity, right? We need to look at food insecurity and say, this needs to be eliminated. We need to provide food. We need to maintain grab and go sites. We need to support our community-based organizations like LSA. And we sh we, it's wonderful that people are donating money tonight. And I, and I applaud that. But New York City, the state and the federal government should be sub supporting in a huge way without applying for grants, these community-based organizations like LSA. And there should be a coordinated effort on giving out food. We shouldn't have to beg, borrow, steal, to use an expression, um, to give food and satisfy hunger and food insecurity in New York City, one of the wealthiest cities in, in the world. Uh, Hallie, any thoughts on what are the, pri the policy priorities here? Yeah, um, I think for, so two things came to mind. One, is, and, and then completely agree with everything that Charles said. Um, so from the borough president's office's perspective, um, I think one thing we can do more on a, a policy and funding level, um, borough presidents of all boroughs and even city council members and city council in general have funding, have capital funding and have um, expense funding. Um, so in that sense, you know, sometimes you make policy by seeing what priorities people give to allocate certain funds. Um, I know for Gail in the Manhattan borough, uh, we have given monies to, you know, capital upgrades for schools to just build out, you know, healthy food kitchens to allow for scrap cooking. Um, but beyond that, you know, like you just don't give them a new kitchen. I mean, besides that, that takes a long time, but also how are you sourcing the food? How are you going to allow for maybe negotiation with um, school food and union workers? Because it does take longer to prep you know, instead of opening a can to chop vegetables and to work out all of the, um, just work it all out. And people are interested, you bring people together. Um, that's one thing that I think our office does is convene and just, you know, through funding, through maybe some policy changes and through also just like actual on the ground partnering with nonprofit like Little Sisters and other organization um, to then kind of form partnerships in order to sustain. Um, I think the sustainability part is very important because you can give money for one fiscal year to make certain things happen and then drop it. Um, so that's not what we want to see. And then very quickly, the second thing that comes to mind um, on the federal level, um, I'm hopeful because I know a lot of um, families in New York City and all over, um, there's a hesitance to access public assistance, SNAP, and all of the help that they need because of this uh, policy called public charge. So if you're undocumented, you want one day to have a path to citizenship. Um, right now, the current administration, because of public charge, is just making people choose between, you know, literally getting housing and food, or maybe one day, you know, to pursue citizenship. So 
that itself puts families in such a hard place and there are families who need the assistance that they should get that they're choosing not to because of that. Um, so I'm hoping you know, this will change come January. There's a lot of hope. There's a lot of need, but there are a lot of great people, places, things going on that really can address this issue. We're gonna to have to conclude tonight's session. I'll leave you with a reiteration of the idea that food security is predictable and preventable, which means that our mission is clear. That's why we're here tonight. Thank you so much to our panelists for letting us know about the solutions that they've been intimately involved with. Repl replicability is important. Sustainability is crucial. Policies to enable the right things to happen at a society, societal level are crucial. Um, thank you to all, for, to all of you for attending. Uh, you can help us with our mission by accessing uh, the information in the chat below. And I wish everyone a safe and healthy and happy holiday season. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.